Hey guys, it's Danny. Alrighty, today we're gonna do another type of videos. Well, I'm trying it out. If you like it, we'll keep it. So I thought about this series called Did You Know? And here's where I will tell you details on certain orchid subjects, not necessarily about certain orchids, a few fun facts here and there that you might not know already. This is mainly aimed for those of you who are at the beginning or who don't have much experience with particular subjects that have to do with orchids, and I thought it would be a fun idea to at least try it out. So today's subject is Cattleya orchids. It is a very broad subject, and of course I will not talk about how to care for them, I have a tutorial, link in description if you're interested, but just a few fun things that I learned along the way with cat layers from experience but also from uh, common knowledge. And as a side note, cat layers are currently my absolute favorite orchid family. It used to be Oncidiums and I still love Oncidiums, but in my new climate, which is warmer than my previous one, Oncidiums don't do as great as cat layers. For me, cats and everything related are very, very rewarding and they really don't give me any headaches because they simply like my climate and environment. So I'm just going to embrace that because as it just so happens, cat layers are one of the most diverse family of orchids at the moment on the market. And by this, I mean hybridization wise. It was the very first orchid to actually be propagated and sold and used massively before the Phalaenopsis. Calia orchids were used as corsage plants. They were very, very showy, unlike any other flower. And of course, people just fell in love with these orchids. So before the Phalaenopsis, it was the Cattleya. In the 1940s, the Cattleya orchid was the flower of choice when it came to fashion. And it was such a wonderful success that we owe our hobby today partly to that era and to the Cattleya orchid. And for this, I will share with you an article down below from Chadwick and Son, which talks more about those times. And I just think it's very, very interesting to learn about it. So check the description down below. Now, because Cattleyas can be quite large as flowers, it's easy to see how they were used in corsages or as other cut flower arrangements, but not all Cattleyas are big. In the family, you can find all sorts of sizes, even quite tiny Cattleyas, depending on the species or variety. The oldest species or hybrids that we know of are typically a little large because they were used in the cut flower business. So here I have one of them. This is the Cattleya mosier, which is one of the oldest Cattleyas known to be grown in cultivation and used for commercial purposes. And you can see how incredibly big this flower is. It's bigger than my palm. If you would put this in an arrangement, it would just pop. It's so big. But in recent years, we do have more variety with Cattleyas. As new crosses are being developed or even new species are being found, you can have a medium-sized Cattleya flower, such as this one. This is a hybrid. You'll find the name somewhere on the screen because it's a big name. But you can see it is quite different, not only in size, but also in shape than the classical Mosier. Now, the bigger the flower is, the fewer flowers a Cattleya can produce. While the hybrids or smaller flowered Cattleyas can produce a cluster of even 20 flowers. So this is a sort of typical to medium display for these Cattleyas, three to four flowers for a medium sized flower. It's pretty typical, but there are hybrids which can produce clusters of smaller blooms rather than big fluffy flowers. Leaving aside the beauty and how fashionable they look like, most Cattleyas are also very fragrant and they have the most beautiful fragrances that I particularly found in the Orchid Kingdom. Everything you see here is fragrant, even though one is a species and the other ones are man-made hybrids. Most classical species have a flowery scent to them. To me, they remind of lilies, even roses, very flowery, very easy to like. But new hybrids can have all sorts of different fragrances since species have been crossed together to create something else. And in my case, this one has a citrusy fragrance to it, while this one has a flowery, citrusy, very hard to describe, scent it's one of actually it's my favorite scent of all time and p.s this is a no id hybrid it's one that we find in flower shops it's a mass-produced hybrid it just happens to be my absolute favorite cattleya for the beauty of the flowers the purity and also the fragrance which i find exquisite 
So with Catlias, even if they are man-made hybrid, you can find absolute gems of orchids, both looks-wise and fragrance-wise. In most cases, you cannot go wrong with a Catlia if you're looking for fragrance. Now let's get into some specifics. Due to the wide variety of their gene pool, Catlias can bloom quite differently in between them. Many of them produce what we call a sheath, which is a modified leaf starting from the top of a maturing or matured cane that already has leaves. And inside that modified leaf, buds will form and grow and be protected by this layer. After a while, you can see the buds emerge outside of the sheath and open up into beautiful flowers. However, not all Catlias do this. Some of them bloom directly from the top of the cane. While the leaf is emerging and forming, the flower buds are forming as well and you can see them grow together with the leaf. That's my absolute favorite Catlia because you don't have to wait around too much for it to prepare the buds. But sometimes it just so happens that you have tiny little buds that should have a sheath but don't. And in many cases, these buds are sensitive and can be lost. They're not as prone to growing to full maturity as a sheath protected one. This is due to hybridization or slight mutations that were left in cultivation because we don't really select individuals all that much. So when it comes to blooming Catlias, it's always a surprise. Will it have a sheath? Will it have some undeveloped buds that we don't know if they're gonna bloom? It's always a surprise, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. Another interesting aspect of Catlia orchids is their color changing abilities. When an orchid first blooms, it can be one color and as it opens up, it can shift to a different color. In many cases, you will not have a very contrasting shift. So for example, the bud opens white and then as it completely unfolds, it becomes this color. It's not that extreme, but you can have flowers that open pink and then as they open up, they become rather white or vice versa, they open up rather white and then they gain color. Also, some Catlias do change their color in accordance to season. For example, this particular one, I believe it displays more intense colors in lower temperatures, while in warmer temperatures it has a more purpley, more pale color. And she's not the only one. Not only will you find Catlia hybrids, so pretty much species of Catlias which have been hybridized crossed together, you can also find intergeneric hybrids, meaning a few species in the Catlia family which are very compatible with each other that have been crossed together to create an intergeneric orchid, such as this one. This is the Ivanagara apple blossom, which is a complex intergeneric and it looks absolutely unique in the Catlia kingdom. Genera that can be crossed together are usually Encyclias, Epidendrums, Schimberchias, Catlias, of course, Sophronides, Lelias, and I do think there are a few more. Catlia flowers, as beautiful and fragrant and majestic as they are, they are not known for being very long-lived, especially nowadays that we compare everything to Phalaenopsis, which could stay in bloom for months. A Catlia orchid can stay in bloom for a maximum of about a month and a half, very rarely more than this, and most probably most of them will lose their flowers after about three weeks. Some of them last only two weeks. So within a month, you can actually have a Catlia completely lose its flowers as part of its life cycle. Flowers of the Catlias are not long lasting, sadly, and that makes it slightly undesirable, again, because of the Phalaenopsis orchid, which kind of spoiled us. However, it does put on a slightly more complex show. Not to worry though, Calia orchids are sympodial orchids and they have continuous growth. They don't take a winter dormancy or anything of the sorts and depending on the species they can create one or two or three, maybe even more in some cases, new pseudobulbs per direction of growth per year. The pseudobulb is this formation right here which is used as a storage device for water and nutrients. Every pseudobulb only blooms once. Once it bloomed, it will never rebloom again. The orchid needs to create another pseudobulb with another set of buds for you to enjoy the show. Luckily, you can have multiple directions of growth, multiple pseudobulbs growing at the same time that will bloom and will put on a great show. This will come with age though. 
And as I was saying, some cat lias produce only one suitable per year, such as the Mosea actually, and only blooms once a year, while others can produce multiple uh, kings per year and bloom, obviously, multiple times a year. This is typical of hybrids. We are trying to produce those Cattleya orchids who bloom multiple times a year, but it's not a rule. You can have species that create multiple pseudobulbs and even hybrids that only grow one pseudobulb. Speaking about these pseudobulbs, some of them have at the top only one leaf. We call these Cattleyas with only one leaf unifoliate while other cattleyas can have two leaves at the top of each cane. We call these bifoliate cattleyas. There is a sort of rumor saying that bifoliate cattleyas are a little bit more finicky. I don't know what to say. I don't really believe it's true, to be honest. I have finicky bifoliates, but also non-finicky bifoliates, and I also have very, very finicky unifoliates, and vice versa. So I don't think it is a rule. There are some species that are known to be finicky, which just happen to be bifoliate. But as a general rule, the hybrids that we use in cultivation and that you can find in flower shop, they should not be very finicky. They have been obtained for mass production, for growing in a home. But yet again, it's not a rule, it's not 100%, it is just a majority. In my experience, I have discovered that Calia orchids do have quite sensitive roots, in the sense that if you damage them through repotting, there is a very, very, very high chance they will just die off. They will not be okay with the damage sustained, especially if you snap them, if you bruise them. In many cases, the older roots of a Cattleya will die off if you repot the orchid. So, repotting a Cattleya at the wrong time of the year might have consequences. If we're talking about hybrids, which are man-made and they're easy to grow and vigorous, this doesn't matter all that much, but with some Cattleyas, particularly the classical species such as the Mosier, it is actually advisable to only disturb the roots for whatever reason once a year, and this is when new roots are starting to grow. This will happen when new growth starts from the base and you will see tiny little root tips just emerging. That's when you should repot because even if the older roots will be lost, new roots will be there to act. So you will not have a very long transition period in which the orchid doesn't have roots. Again, with hybrids, it doesn't matter all that much, they're not all that finicky, but since they grow multiple shoots per year, usually, you will have multiple roots produced per year. It's not like the case of the Mossier, but you can see how some Cattleyas should actually be messed with at particular times a year. Cattleyas come in all the colors of the rainbow, and even more than that. One color that you will not find with Cattleyas, though, as with many orchids, is black. This color is not something that you will find commonly with orchids, and most orchids which possess this color or very close to this color are usually hybrids. Other than that though, you can have close to blue Cattleya orchids, usually they're called Cerulea types or Cerulea varieties. You can have true pure reds, which again can be hard to find in the orchid kingdom. Uh, purples, pinks, whites, that's very, very common, but also orange, flaming orange and red and yellow combinations and golden yellows and green even. I have a Cattleya which is green, very nice lime green. So pretty much all of these colors are available with Cattleya orchids and in my opinion the variety is much bigger than in the case of Phalaenopsis orchids. So don't fret, if you're tired of pink orchids, then take a look at the Cattleyas, they do have pretty awesome colors. And in the end, Cattleyas are one of the easiest orchids to grow, especially if it is a commercial hybrid. Not only they are not very, very finicky, but they could not care less about humidity. You can grow them in 30%, 40% humidity. As long as you keep them watered, everything should be okay. You can grow them at the temperatures you have inside your home, water them with less than ideal water, and for the main part, they should be okay. The only thing they actually do really care about is light. So if you place a Cattleya in a home in a very dark location, it will not do great, most probably it will not bloom, even though leaves and pseudobulbs might be produced. However, in the winter time, I did experience smaller pseudobulbs with these orchids. They are highlight orchids and they prefer to be rather warm than cold, although they are very tolerant to cold as well. So overall, when it comes to home conditions, they are very well suited. What they don't like though is to be disturbed repottings, messing about with the root system, cutting the root system and so on, it really sets them back 
and you can wait several years until the pseudobulbs grow big enough to be able to bloom. But that's a whole different story. Setting back orchids is never fun and cattleyas are not the only orchids you can set back. They're just prone to being very set back and I will share with you a video about the subject down below in the description if you don't know much about them. And I believe that is about it for Calia orchids for this video. Of course, we can actually go on and on, especially for particular Calia orchids, but for now it has to be enough. This is what I envisioned when I thought about the Did You Know series. Just a few fun facts about Calia. So let me know down below if you enjoyed this type of video. Again, it's not going to refer to only species, varieties and so on, but certain structures as well, certain aspects of orchid growing. Let me know if you've enjoyed it. And for today, thank you so much for watching and I do hope you had a good time and learned something new. And and you know the drill, if you did enjoy this video, give it a thumbs up if you hated it, give it a thumbs down, subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos and don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. And with that said, I'll see you all next time, bye!